Salve, Joe, how are you today? I'm good. How are you, Christian? Very well here. <laughs> it's uh, quite a time that we're living in, isn't it, in the depth of this pandemic? And I guess that's the, the theme here, right? Canto per canto, conversations with Dante in our time. And it's interesting to talk with somebody who's uh, seven centuries ago and was, was writing this great poem that we're all reading today and how we can have a conversation across time like that and across distance virtually. And then again, with all of you who are watching this whenever. I think you're right. And I think, you know, the whole point of this project, which has drawn me to it, um, it's such a powerful idea is that, you know, each generation finds um, their own Dante, right? Uh, everyone has to make Dante relevant to their lives in their individual way. And um, here we are seven centuries later, uh, reading the poem, interpreting it, making sense of it and connecting it to our daily lives. Good. So maybe we should just give a little background on ourselves for those who are listening here. Uh, my name is Kristen DuPont and I'm speaking to you from my office here at Boston College where I'm the director of the John J. Burns Library for Rare Books, Special Collections and Archives and uh, also serve as the secretary for the Dante Society of America and uh, privileged to have uh, some <laughs> tokens of our, uh, of our society here uh, in the background for our conversation. Fantastic. I'm uh, Joseph Luzzi. I'm a professor of comparative literature at Bard College. I'm also a faculty member in Italian studies and um, I teach Dante almost every academic year. And, you know, uh, I think it was in uh, Moby Dick where um, Ishmael says something like, you know, the whale boat was my Harvard and my Yale College or something <laughs> reverse them. Dante is my university. I, I continue to study him. Uh, I always find something new when I read him, and you know, it's uh, I consider myself a, a lifelong learner in Dante studies. Uh, and an author, so I certainly write a lot about Dante. I know you have a new book you're just finishing up on Sandro Botticelli's drawings of the that he made for the Divine Comedy and how they were dispersed and then you know recovered in time. You've also written two other scholarly books and two books of uh, for more general readers, one of which we'll be talking about a little bit later on. That's um, right. But, Dante is uh, always a touchstone. Always a touchstone, and I think yeah. our, you know, in our other conversations, uh, uh, you've helped me in, uh, in just thinking about um, you know, certain themes that are kind of common in, in, in literature that can really help us with Dante and reading this poem. So I thought if you could you know, share uh, those insights you, and ideas you have for, uh, that will help readers of any level of experience and knowledge of Dante and his world to, to, to better engage with this great poem of his. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's so fitting in a way that we're discussing Inferno 1, because uh, we're at the start of the journey. And I think right from the beginning of Dante's journey uh, in this first canto, he puts on the table, uh, gives to the reader, really three essential, um, uh, you know, categories that will sustain the entire poem. One, the first one comes right from the opening line, right? Nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita mi ritrovai per una selva oscura. In the middle of our life's journey, I found myself in a dark wood. And I just, I find that tension between the pronouns so, uh, so moving, right? It's our life, right? It, it's, it's all of us. We're all going to end up in this space of suffering in the dark wood. Um, and yet it's Dante's individual story mi trovai, right? So, and I think that tension drives the whole poem, the, the tension between the individual Dante and the life of, you know, humanity writ large. Dante really speaks for, um, you know, he's writing it as a Christian, but I think we've all seen over the century, this poem can, people from all different religions, people from all different belief systems can relate to this poem. And part of it is, I think, because of that you know, that space of crisis that he articulates in the beginning. Um, we yeah. all will end up in the dark wood. Uh, we all have our different versions of it. And, you know, um, I think Dante teaches us, and this is something I've written about, it's not what lands you in the dark wood, but what you do to get out that right. will define you. So I think that that's the first thing. The second one is, you know, I know you're going to talk a little bit about this um, more at length, is Dante needs a guide. <laughs> he gets a lot of help. There's a lot of people helping Dante. You know, the Virgin Mary takes pity on him. Beatrice, of course, um, is his muse and also his guide later in the poem. But in Inferno 1, we meet the guide who will get him through Inferno and Purgatorio, most of Purgatorio, uh, Virgil, right? And um, Dante cannot take this journey. He cannot get out of the dark wood 
without a guide. I just think that's such a powerful um, statement suggestion, you know, that we all need guides in life. We all need teachers, partners, helpers that, that help us make our way. And, and, you know, Dante's poem is so much about that. And the third thing I, I think really he sets up in um, Inferno that will sustain the poem is just how profoundly he loves literature. Right. Um, we see in Inferno one a, a, a person who's having a crisis. Right. We can call it a midlife crisis, literally, because, right. you know, he sets it at age 35, which is half of a bi biblical life. And yet one of the things that sustain him um, during this crisis, one, of course, is the guide. Right. Whether it's Virgil or Beatrice. Uh, another is his belief in the power of literature. You know, when he chooses Virgil, when he chooses this Latin poet from 13 hundred years ago, like the remote past, he's drawn to Virgil because of his belief in Virgil's writing and the power of literature to create a transformative experience, to give you paradigmatic wisdom and to nurture you in your darkest hour, mm -hmm. what Dante's describing here. So I think those three things from Inferno One mm -hmm. make this poem so much more about, you know, um, this certainly, it's a Christian poem. It's certainly written in the Middle Ages and both those contexts inform it at every stage. Mm -hmm. But the resonances are so much deeper because of these broader human issues that Dante puts on the table mm. through these three mm -hmm. elements in Inferno One. Right. These human issues, which really play out in the narrative of the poem. So just to recap that briefly, right? So he's, right. you know, in the middle of our life, he finds himself in a dark wood. Right. He's alone. He's afraid. He wants to get out. He wants to <laughs> he get starts out. He's trying to making his way. And he sees a hill far off in the distance. There's the sunlight of dawn is starting to mantle its shoulders. He starts walking towards it and then walking up it. Um, and then these three beasts appear and start chasing him off the mountain. Um, and he becomes discouraged and the fear that he felt so acutely in the wood returns to him again. He's being forced back into the wood. And then as he's being forced back, he looks off in the distance, right? And there's this figure, a shadowy figure. And he right. pulls out, right? Have pity on me. You know, whether you are a, a living man or a right. shade, he's doubtful. Right? Yeah. And then the figure approaches him and starts speaking to him. Right? Um, and Dante is just struck dumb and silent and gradually this recognition, you know, comes to him, right? Uh, of who this figure is. Right? Absolutely, right. Uh, but then before this figure stops, this is Virgil, of course, you know, speaking to it, he chastises him, okay? And I think the, the frame I like to explore is a little bit of the, the relation between the father and the son, right? We've talked mm -hmm. about the gods and everything, but let's, let's take it in this, you know, sort of sense. So, uh, Dirk, you know, Virgil concludes that first speech by saying it like, Ma tu perché ritorni a tanta noia? Perché non sali di la cosa monte? Che principio a cagione di tutto gioia? Why are you going back to all this tiresome trouble? I love that word in Italian, noia. There's an the expression, che right. noia, you know? Che noia. What a, right. what a bother. Okay? You know, it's actually this, this sinful life of, 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 like, why don't you go up the delightful mountain, which right. is the force and cause of every joy? And this is where, like in that father-son relationship, Dante doesn't quite get it, right? Because with Virgil, you know, the, the situation is he's in limbo. He's actually in the dam. He can never go up to Never, power. that's right. Okay? Dante that's right. doesn't realize it. And it's all about him. And he says, well, I'm afraid. You know, how are you going to get me out of here? Okay? Right. So, and he doesn't really answer, you know, Virgil's question, you know, about why aren't you going up? And eventually Virgil comes around, Virgil comes around and says, well, you know, I guess, you know, if you're that afraid, you need a guide, you need yeah. you. And the only way I can take you is the way where I'm come from. We need to go back into the dark wood, but we'll go together. And right. We'll climb up to purgatory and then I'll bring you to another guide who can take you from there. Um, so that's all the situation, right? Just some sort of narrative. And I think I, that, that father-son dynamic, what he calls out, you know, with that surprise, you know, I can't really believe it's you, you know, his fa a father whom he thought he would never meet because he had died centuries before he was born. So there's a lot of emotion and, and drama there. But um, Absolutely. Thinking, you know, the other level is just as you say, you know, Virgil is this figure from classical antiquity, somebody he studied in school, right? Right. There's that other level and Dante is going to be writing this great poem. So Talk to me about that, you know, this idea. Well, of I, first of all, I think you, you gave a beautiful recapitulation of the, the drama. It sounds so cinematic, you know, Dante um, going through this dark wood, encountering these beasts, and then, 
you know, seeing this figure of, of this august figure of the, the great Latin poet, the great Roman poet, the, the you know, um, Virgilio, um, I think you're right to kind of point out the rhetoric of father and son that's so powerful there. And I think it's an allegory, the way I read it, of like Dante's quest for um, his understanding of what it means to be an author, right? You know, he, think how just, you know, he's writing an epic poem, but it's not about the founding of Rome like Virgil or about the Trojan War like Homer or the, the hero's homecoming in, in the Odyssey. It's about a, a regular Florentine guy who's, you know, lost his way in the world, a very talented guy, of course. But, you know, Dante, I think, is um, doing something quite transgressive in that he's daring, in a sense, to write an epic poem about the self, right? And he's on sort of, that can, in terms of literary history, that can be thin ice. Even in the next canto, uh, Canto Two, which you know we won't talk about at length, but there's a moment getting back to this fear where Virgil picks up on Dante's fear, and Dante says, "You know, why am I here? I am not Aeneas. I am not Saint Paul, right? Mm -hmm. um, who who sanctions this journey? Who grants it?" And I think that line is so fascinating because it brings us back to the paura in Inferno One and the quest for authority, right? Dante's own quest for authority. By saying he's not Aeneas and mm -hmm. saying he's not Saint Paul, like on the one hand, the great Latin classical epic hero, on the other hand, the great Christian uh, story of conversion, in a way they become the shadows of his journey, right? The mm -hmm. two poles that he's got to negotiate. And they become a way of almost Dante staking out his claim as the parameters of this journey, right? Who are my models? Who are my poetic fathers? Like, who are the people I'm going to emulate in writing this great poem? Mm -hmm. And I think it's Dante's own way to come to terms with the incredible, you know, it's so it's so easy. I see that statue behind you. We think of Dante as a statue. <laughs> like all these Italian cities have La Statua di Dante, right? Uh, the, the, the Piazza Dante, Via Dante, right? we got to remember it was written in his hand, right. uh, could have failed. It turned out to be an extraordinary success immediately, right. pretty much. Right. Uh, soon after his death, his book is, you know, the Divine Comedy is circulating like crazy. But Dante needs to come to terms with the poetic traditions that precede him. Mm -hmm. And he needs in a way to kind of find a way to negotiate his way through them. Mm -hmm. which to me is, is a, a bit of like a son facing the legacy of his father or, or a daughter facing the legacy of his father. We can use whatever uh, genetic um, parental rhetoric we want, but it, you know, the, the, the burden of tradition and what one does with it. Right. right? So these are things that, that we learn. We, we start reading literature or, or hearing it from our parents, but then there's moments in life, these crises that come back. Around, right. Right. That really bring it home to us and then suddenly texts that we've known take on an entirely new meaning and i and i'd like to just ask you to take a couple more minutes and, and, and make it more personal for you joe right um you mentioning a daughter is not a, a consequence here right is that right. you have a very you know heart rending awfully heart mending story that you've written about in your memoir in a dark wood about um the grief and the mysteries of healing and love so to, please Tell well, I, I appreciate that. So, you know, I studied Dante um, going back now. It's, it's been 30 years. I've taught him for some 20 years. Um, and, you know, like you, like anyone who, who does Dante for a living, in a sense, you, you feel familiar with the work. And, and then suddenly it takes on a whole new life for you. And that happened to me, um, you know, in, in 2007, when um, my late wife, Catherine, um, had a a fatal car accident and she was eight and a half months pregnant and um, 45 minutes before she died, she gave birth um, to our daughter, Isabel, who, mm -hmm. you know, was survived miraculously healthy and now is a thriving, um, you know, uh, seventh grader. The, the impact though of that event in my life, you know, I left the house that morning to go teach and then I got news of what had happened and as I, you know, as I wrote in my book in a dark wood, I'd left the house around 8.30 by noon, I was a widower and a father, you know, and that put me on, as you can imagine, a, a period of intense grief and, and that which eventually became mourning through years um, after years. But in those years back and rejoining the living, 
my own rejoining of the living, uh, I heard Dante's voice in a new way that I'd never, never heard before. I always thought I would write, you know, I'd written quite a bit on Dante, but suddenly my idea or plan for writing a traditionally scholarly book changed. An event like that has to change you. And so I ended up writing about how Dante's voice and wisdom, and I really will emphasize his voice because I felt like I heard it for the first time in a way that I had never heard before. When he talks about, you know, his exile, like in Paradiso, he says, you will leave behind the things you love most dearly. And that is the bow, that is the arrow first released by the bow of exile. Tu lascerai ogni cosa più diletta, you know, and, and that, that was, I heard the voice. I picture um, you walking every, 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 um, you know, alone, right? Because there are times when even the consolation of other people can't really help you, right? So you find us walking on the coastlines there in your native Rhode Island and, you know, at night and hearing Dante and having these conversations like us with Dante, literally, right? You know, I don't know if Dante, and again, um, we're all readers centuries later. None of, we can't approach Dante's vision and talent, but I think he gives us the gift of, of his poem to use in our lives as we will in our own small way. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what Dante's exile felt like, but I know what I learned in grief was that no matter how much I have a big loving family, wonderful friends, my entire community at Bard was behind me. It's something you have to go through on your own. Mm -hmm. And you do feel that sense of, um, of loneliness. And, and Dante's voice was able to, to pierce that. And I, I, I could hear, you know, the poem is, is, it's a very, as you know, it's so incredibly learned. There's so, there's so many illusions. Right. He's, he's profoundly erudite, but there's also that voice, that vulnerability, like in Paradiso 25, where he says, semai contingua che il poema sacro, right? Should it ever come to pass that this sacred poem to which heaven and earth have both said him, you can hear the suffering in his voice. And I, to me, that's what makes right. Inferno one in, particular in Dante in general, such an incredibly human experience, you know, for, for all readers to, to find their connection to Dante, to find the way that maybe Dante can uh, illuminate their own crisis as he did mine all those years ago. And sometimes that's where we can, we, we bring that, our experience with home and, and uh, sometimes it's too many words and it's too complex, but you have another little technique here, right? Sometimes you work with your students here in reading a canto, right? Uh, to, in order to, to, to just sort of bring it home and to find a way to meditate on the meaning of the canto. I always have the students, we always look at the Italian, even when I'm teaching in translation. You mm -hmm. always, I say, that's his voice. You know, uh, Benjamin talks about the aura of the artwork. There's the aura of Dante's voice right there. When you right. see those original words, when you see paura in Inferno One, when you see Selva Oscura, those words are so resonant for Dante. And that's why he wrote, of course, in Tuscan, when, had, had he written in Latin, he would have had a much broader audience of the educated, right? Mm -hmm. He took a great risk, mm -hmm. but he knew he had to write his life story in a living idiom and a language that was alive. And mm -hmm. Christian, as I think about that, you know, um, maybe that's a good time for us to, to think about, um, what what word? If you had to pick one word, right? Well, I was thinking like, about that. He's just saying the students. You know, what the word that I would choose? What would the word that you would choose to sort right. of so that, that brings it, that yeah. makes, sort of encapsulates it? Right. Uh, you suggested, uh, you know, paura being a theme. That's where it starts. And in yeah. fact, that word is used five times in the uh, in just That's right. one alone, and it comes up numerous times. But the one I seized on um, is, in fact, the word joya, which I mentioned earlier, right? Going up to, you know, that uh, delightful, the mountain of, of delight, which is the source of every uh, joy, okay? Right. In other right. words, the only time it appears in the canto, of course, it's more like, but it's that contrast. And, you know, and this is where reading in Italian, because, and why we're doing a little bit of rehearsal Italian here as we're in this recording, because to hear that. So joya is um, uh, in opposition to noia in that, three-line tercet structure of, of Dante's poem here, right? The Terza Um, So these contrasts, so, you know, the uh, the joy that brings love, that brings hope in life, right? And this is the opposite of, of paura. So already Dante, in this depth of inferno, in, in presenting this poem as an author, is is giving you the destination. This is not, and that's why it's a comedian, it's a poem that ends in hope. That's right. Tragedy, all right? So that's my word, joy. Ah, oh, I love it. You know, in a way, it's, it's, it's a beautiful choice because it, it's so counterintuitive, right? You don't think of joy, you don't associate joy with 
Inferno One, you associate Paura, that oft repeated yeah. word, but you're right. That's, that's what the, what's on the other side of Paura, the joya. And that, that's why I always tell students or anyone, you have to read the poem through to Paradiso. Don't get, Inferno's yeah. dramatic, it's entertaining, but make it through. And in the spirit of your choice, my choice is okay. not really a word, but kind of a, 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 a phrase that Dante uses. When he meets uh, Virgilio, he says, you know, Vaglia mio lungo studio, il grande amore, che mi ha fatto cercare il tuo volume. Lungo studio and grande amore, long study and great love. To me, that, that sums up the entire Divine Comedy, not just Inferno One. Yeah. You have to study it. It's going to take a long time. <laughs> the barriers to entry are, are, are there. It's not an easy work. Dante's incredibly mm -hmm. elusive. You know, there's, there's, it's steeped in doctrine. But through that long study, and I just love the connection, because again, it's a little bit counterintuitive. We don't usually link long study and great love, but Dante shows us that anything that is worth long mm. study is something for which we have to feel great love, or we just will not put in the, the mm. time, the effort, and the investment of you know, energy, intellect, and emotion. So um, to me, that's like the epitome of Inferno One. Mm -hmm. Lungo studio in grande amore. grande amore. Good. Well, maybe we'll leave everyone and ourselves with that thought here to, to meditate as we move about the day. Uh, Joe, this has been a, as all of our conversations, a really wonderful one, a warm one, one that, that leaves me uh, desiring always more. So, so that's to be so. continued, uh, to more conversations and, uh, you know, uh, buona lettura. Buona lettura. <laughs> to you all. Thank you for listening and, and, and enjoy your reading. Thank you. Good. Thank you.